we're going to get going. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dave Gustin. I'm the director of the School for the Future of Innovation and Society. And welcome to our first enlightening lunch talk of the spring semester and of 2019. Welcome to 2019. Welcome to life with partial government. Um, and welcome to the talk by uh, Heather Ross. Um, Heather is um, among a faculty at SFIS of utterly unique individuals. Heather is even more unique than that. Um, about a third of our faculty are shared with other units. We actually share Heather with two other units. In addition, we're appointed in the School for the Human Innovation Society. Um, she has appointments in the College of Nursing and Health Innovation, where one of her doctoral degrees is from, uh, her second doctoral degree is from uh, us in our new and social dimensions program. We also share her with the Global Security uh, Initiative. Um, what's perhaps even more interesting about Heather, and this is what she's going to be uh, talking about today, um, is that last year she ran uh, in a congressional campaign as a candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives um, in former lifetimes, before ASU, when I was at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, I had politicians and former politicians on my faculty, um, folks whose names wouldn't necessarily mean anything uh, to people out here in Arizona, uh, but former New Jersey governor and House of Representatives member Jim Florio, for example, and so I'm you know, used to dealing with the political personality. Heather quite is in uh, Florio's league like that, um, but she really, uh, I think, I'm really looking forward, actually, to seeing what she, you know, learned and what she can convey to us about what she learned on the campaign trail um, over the past year, and you know, maybe reflect on whether she is happy to be here or whether she would rather be um, in the utterly dysfunctional place that Washington is right now. Um, and you know, just a reminder about the differences between that kind of place and the kind of place you're in, that if Heather had been giving this talk a year ago to y'all, we'd be hitting you up for money on the way out. <laughs> so, no further ado, Heather Ross. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm not saying that you don't know, have to put your money somewhere uh, after this talk, and you're certainly welcome to do that. Um, I'm very glad to be here with you today and share some of the things that I came to realize differently as a candidate for federal office. Coming with the perspective that I brought uh, as a faculty member, as a researcher, as a nurse practitioner, and uh, the title of this talk is False Dualities in the Future of Democracy, Field Notes from a Scientist on the Campaign Trail. Um, yes, these are things that I sort of cataloged as I was, was going through and came to realize that, um, spoiler alert, we got some big problems, <laughs> really big problems. So let me tell you a little bit about, additionally, about my background, in addition to uh, being a faculty member here in a few different units, and I teach primarily health policy and technology policy uh, here at ASU. I also maintain an active clinical practice in cardiac electrophysiology. I see patients one day a week, and I continue doing that throughout uh, the campaign. And that really informed quite a lot of why I ran for office. You know, I, I told the story, and some of you were at campaign events and, and were very enthusiastic supporters of my campaign, and, and I thank you for that. Um, and uh, you have also been very enthusiastic supporters of me as a scholar and me as a person, and I really thank you for that. You know, I noticed something uh, going into the 2016 election with my patients particularly, I noticed that my patients were, uh, I knew how they were all going to vote. I knew how they were all registered to vote because that's all that anybody talked about. And coming into the fall of 2016, I noticed a pretty clear difference in my patients. I noticed that my Democrat patients were happy, they were optimistic, their blood pressures were under good control, their arrhythmias were very low, everything was good. And I would go into the next room and see one of my Republican patients who was grumpy, their blood pressure was high, their pacemaker maybe had been misbehaving a little bit. And 
we went along like that until about November 9th, 2016, when everything flipped. And all of a sudden, my Democrats were like dragging their feet, and they were very sad, and their blood pressures were high, and we were having to have the talk about, did you eat extra bacon this morning because we really need to lay off? Um, and meanwhile, my Republican patients, some of whom I had never seen smile, in five years, I had never seen people smile. They were practically skipping into my office and their blood pressures were under good control for the first time. And I realized that we are in a time right now where half of our country feels like not being representative or represented. And I thought, that's not right. That is not the America that I signed up for. That is not the America that any of us signed up for this for the people situation, even before Kamala Harris said it. And I thought, you know, we've got to do something about that. And long story short, ran to my, uh, my decision to run. Well, that was not my first engagement with, uh, with, with politics <coughs> and policy. So for years, I've been working on a, uh, a theoretical framework with one of my colleagues, uh, formerly of ASU, now at the University of Arizona, who also serves in the state legislature. And this was informed by some of my earlier experiences. Some of you know that 25 and a half years ago, I uh, was an intern with Senator John McCain. Uh, I really, I had had this experience when I was a graduating high school senior where I was taken to Washington, D.C. I won a congressional prize and went to the Capitol Hill and I remember sitting across from uh, John Kyle actually and I remember sitting at his, at his desk, he was talking and he said, so what do you want me to know? I was 16 years old and I distinctly remember turning around to see who he was talking to <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm a kid, I'm a kid, why, and why should I be able to tell you things? And that dawned on me, oh, there's a real role for citizens in this system that we have, and I wanted to be part of it, so I went and uh, worked for Senator McCain. And so that was early introduction for me to politics. Over the years then, my career did not go into politics, but rather I ended up in this role where I was engaged in policy as a healthcare provider and as a scholar of health policy and technology policy. And I thought, I could be a much more effective policy advocate if I steer clear of this dirty politics stuff. And so I kept them separate. Over time, I came to realize that they can't, politics and policy really can't exist in separate spheres. Much more, there's a Venn diagram. And where they overlap, that's where the work gets done. And further, I came to understand that that all exists within the extant culture. So with that framework being developed and, and becoming part of my practice, I ventured onto the campaign trail. So one of the things you may remember from the spring of 2017 was the March for Science. Did anybody here participate in the March for Science? A couple people. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for marching. Um, there was a lot of energy. We said there was a lot of energy around science. We felt like there was an attack on science from President Trump in the White House, from members of the federal government, the US Congress particularly. And so this energy around science moved a lot of people, including me, to run for Congress. One of those people was a healthcare colleague, an oncologist and oncology researcher, Jason Weston, who ran for Congress in Texas. And I want to show you uh, his, the ad that he ran. Um, and the, the clever part now will be to uh, find where that is living on my laptop. And getting my laptop to action. 
moving along. Um, the reason I want to show you this ad is because <coughs> Jason Weston, let's see, you know what, I'm just going to tell you. Jason Weston ran this wonderful ad. It was a 30 second ad and it said, science is under attack, truth is under attack. I'm running for Congress because I'm a doctor and I'm gonna stand up for truth and I'm gonna stand up for science. Jason Weston, with his impassioned plea for science, did not make it out of his primary, okay? He's a great guy. He had a tremendous amount of financial support. He walked into, I met him at Candidate Week at the DCC uh, in October of 2017. He had the support of dozens of incumbent members of Congress. He was doing great. We shared a uh, video consultant. And who thought this ad was going to be it because everybody was behind science. <coughs> Everybody was not behind science. So I also then uh, launched my campaign and I ran, we really foregrounded that I was a nurse. Heather Ross for Congress, the nurse we need for the health care we deserve. This was from the mailer that went out to about 75,000 households. Um, as you can tell, I'm also not in Congress. Jason Weston and I didn't make it through. Science and this search for truth, as it turns out, didn't carry a whole lot of weight. Did anybody see this article in Science uh, in, in uh, uh, October? And it talked about all of the different scientists who ran for office, uh, who ran for Congress particularly, and just the ones who are underlined were the ones who even made it through their primaries, okay? And only eight <coughs> scientists of the dozens of scientists who ran for Congress ended up being elected. And most of those who weren't, were elected did not run on particularly pro-science platforms. We, in our school, really, really hold science up here on a pedestal, and we believe that science has intrinsic goods to offer society, and I'm here to tell you that the society that we're living in, that extant culture, does not agree such that they would make that the primary factor that they're going to exercise their political will through voting. So what did I learn about political messaging? Science, obviously, science was not it. And I can tell you, when I stood in front of crowds many times a week, and I would say, I'm a nurse, I'm a scientist, like nothing from I'm a scientist, like didn't matter did not matter. One of the things that I came to hear is that a lot of people who were running for office would claim, I'm the pro-science candidate, and they've never done science. They've never practiced in any kind of scientific field, but they would say, I'm the scientist. And what I came to learn about political messaging is that you can pretty much stand up and say, anything as long as you dumb it down. There are wise people in the world who say you campaign in poetry and govern in prose. Campaigning in poetry does not square with communicating the truths that we understand from science. Campaign messaging and political messaging requires you to tell a simpler story than what is actually true. And you always have to think about a bumper sticker. So when I went to the uh, when I went to candidate week, I was the only candidate, I was the only Democratic candidate in my race who was invited to come to candidate week at the DNC and the DCCC. That's the Democratic National Committee and the uh, Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, or if you really want to be on the end, we call it the DTRIP. So if anybody ever says D-trip to you, now you know what they're talking about. And don't give them your email address. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Um, 
they told us that the biggest problem that Democrats have is that whereas Republicans communicate in headlines, <coughs> Democrats communicate in footnotes. Now, when I was told that, I thought, well, footnotes have the most interesting stuff in them. <laughs> right? Here's part of why I'm not in Congress today. <laughs> so Al Franken, you can think what you want about Al Franken, and Kirsten Gillibrand caused us to move in some directions about Al Franken. Oh, no. For some reason, it didn't come forward. What Al Franken said is, the biggest problem with Democrats' bumper stickers is they all end with, continued on next bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. Bumper stickers don't get to complexity. And as we know, we're living in complex times. Policy and politics are yet ever increasingly complex. Humans are also complex. I'll tell you, I went to, uh, during my campaign, I went to a funeral, I went to a bunch of funerals, but I went to a funeral for a woman who was a, my, a, my friend's mother. Now this woman stood for, in her life, two big things outside of her family. One was childhood vaccines. She worked <coughs> tirelessly her whole adult life to make sure that every child in her community was vaccinated. I think that's really a social good. I can get behind that. The other thing she worked very hard for in her adult life was the NRA, National Rifle Association. Mm -hmm. To the point where the night that she died, my friend received three phone calls of condolence on passage of her mother. One from Governor Doug Ducey, one from Senator John McCain, and the third from NRA President Wayne LaPierre. So I'm at the funeral remembering this woman who was incredibly complex. And I really, in a very visceral way, felt I don't, I don't have an easy way to feel about her. <clears throat> And ev this is everybody. Everybody is complex. Every policy issue that we face is complex. But humans don't like complexity. It's hard to hold two competing ideas in your head at one time. That's why people don't like to do it. And that is why, as a society, we like bumper stickers because they're simple, but they don't get to the issues. So we like to categorize, and one of the uh, works that I have called on a lot in my scholarly career is about to start sorting things out. We like to put things in categories, and a two-category system is the simplest way to think about things. Humans are complex. Humans don't like complexity. And voters, as it turns out, are humans. You know, campaign people will tell you opposite, but I'm here to tell you voters are humans. So, and I apologize that uh, this didn't come out. So on the left, it should say oh, polarization. So one of the things that I came to uh, appreciate is the wrong word. One of the things that I came to observe and understand and really worry about is polarization. John Adlon, you may know him from The Daily Beast. He was the editor-in-chief of The Daily Beast. He's now uh, on CNN. You'll see him on CNN. Uh, I knew him from college. And in 2010, he wrote a book called Wing Nuts. Wayne Nuts talked about the increasing polarization of our two major political parties in America. And I remember reading it in 2010 and thinking, oh yeah, he's got something there. And then I went back and read Wayne Nuts again in 2017 and thought, oh dear God, like it's worse than we thought. It's worse now than he ever had predicted in 2010. And that really squared with my observations from my patients, with the conversations I had with voters 
and as we know, a lot of non-voters, because that's what we have in our country, on the campaign trail. And that's when I came to understand this polarization and the use of litmus tests going to the, a two-category system. Everybody was working off of litmus tests, these purity tests. And I was hearing political scientists talk in the Twitter sphere, talk on, in the, uh, the world of, um, of podcasts, and I listen to a lot of policy podcasts uh, from both polls, okay? Talking about how polarization is good for American politics. How when things were working pretty well in our country, you know, it was confusing for voters. Because when we had moderate Republicans and blue dog Democrats as significant, you know, segments of the Congress, voters didn't know who to vote for. They couldn't just vote for the Republican or vote for the Democrat. They were too similar. And so it's better for America if there's more polarization. This is what people were arguing. I heard people over and over and over use the term centrist as a pejorative term. <clears throat> I heard people talk about abandoning the center as a moral good. Well, for me, this doesn't square with the empirical evidence. What we know is that Congress our legislative bodies work best when there is bipartisanship, when they work together in the center. This does not fit with this uh, lionization of polarity and polarization. And so I came to see these false dualities, that we have a system that is setting up false dualities, that is creating purity tests, litmus tests, instead of recognizing the true complexity around issues and around people. This litmus test, these false dualities, are what is driving American politics today. Here's the problem with bringing science into politics. Scientists are really interested in telling the truth. And scientists are really not interested in oversimplifying. These things aren't squaring with politics today. And this is a real threat for our country. I would say it's a threat to our democracy. And I would go even further and say that broadly, this system of false dualities that we are lionizing as a country that we're propelling may be the biggest threat to our democracy. There are lots of other threats to our democracy. Don't get me wrong, there's a long, long list. But the problem of false dualities, I suggest, is right up at the top, and a lot of things fall under it. So again, back to this politics and policy, and don't you love when it just doesn't translate quite right? Again, this is where the work is done. And so as we go forward as the science community, I suggest we have to keep this in mind and engage in this space where the work is done. So I promised you some, some field notes. I developed a, uh, a public presence that I wasn't expecting. So uh, some of you might recognize uh, that guy uh, from HBO. He happens to be my brother. And uh, we happened to run into each other uh, at, I was in LA for a campaign event um, because we raise money wherever money is. Uh, when we're on the, the campaign trail, and he was in LA uh, at a pitch meeting at a studio. So, uh, you know, that got seen by a bunch of people who were part of the Weed community because that's his jam. Um, I also got to have some conversations with some people I never thought I would have conversations with, like this guy who best selfies in the business. You know, when you're that tall, the selfie arm, it's just really good. Um, but he is really inspiring and very passionate. Another gentleman who's incredibly inspiring and passionate 
is this guy. And um, I still get a little moment when I think about uh, the time that I was able to have a conversation with him. He's wonderful. So. Who are they? Oh, you don't know? I'm sorry. No, I'm ignorant. Oh, no, well, you're not ignorant uh, no way. for long. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> current okay, so that guy, his name is Ben Sinclair. He has a show on HBO called High Maintenance. Oh, well, more importantly, he's your brother, so that's okay. There's that, yeah. Uh, so this guy is Cory Booker. He's getting ready to run for president in the clown car of the Democratic primary. Um, <laughs> oh, it's just get ready. Heard, heard, yeah. the, heard the name, didn't recognize the hairstyle. Yeah, Senator Cory Booker. Uh, this guy is Congressman John Lewis, who represents the district uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, you may recognize him from um, from marching with uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, I, again, recognize the name, just not the face. So. Yeah, yeah. His face always looks like that. Exactly like that. <laughs> like, really exactly like that. Okay. Again, good hair. And so in addition to talking with those guys, I spent time out talking with voters. Here I am gathering petition signatures uh, for not even my own petition signatures, but a ballot initiative petition signatures. And these are the things that we do. And so some of the things that I heard talking with voters, I often heard this from voters. I'm only voting for women. And I would, as a woman, say, oh, <laughs> don't you always want to make sure you're voting for the right candidate? And I would hear, yes, that's why I'm only voting for women. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Okay, so I would also, uh, well, that's not helpful. <laughs> Too frequently, I would hear from voters, well, you know, when I go in to vote, I usually don't recognize a lot of the names. So if I, uh, if I don't recognize any of the candidates, but I recognize a name that I saw in a sign, I'll vote for that one. Okay. Okay. You gotta look that out for us. Heard far too frequently from Democratic primary voters. Is she the Democrat? Then yes. So we call people up or, uh, at the doors once the ballot's mailed out and say, hey, did you vote already? Uh, you got your mail-in ballot? Yeah, yeah, I already voted. Great, did you vote for Heather Ross for Congress? And people would say, and this was about a quarter of people, would say, oh, Heather Ross, is she the Democrat? Then yes, I voted for her. I only voted for Democrats. Now let's remember, this was a Democratic primary election, okay? Yeah, yeah. So this is what we're dealing with. These are voters, okay? <laughs> People who really show up and do their due diligence as citizens. This is a problem. Heard never, <laughs> I'm only voting for scientists. <laughs> yeah. We got our work cut out for our science community. Ah, okay. So, I was frequently attacked, that says too bipartisan. I was frequently attacked for being too bipartisan. I was attacked by an ASU professor, publicly. She talks to Republicans. She's not gonna represent us. Yeah. I would often say to voters, and I would often say to crowds, listen, my job as a nurse is to take care of everybody. Not just the people that I like, not just the Democrats, not just the Republicans, but everybody. And frankly, that's the same job as an elected official, is to take care of everybody. I was attacked for that. <coughs> Bump stock gate. So we were asked a question at a forum, at a Democratic forum, would you ban bump stocks? Now I'll mention that that was all over Twitter. It was the day after Twitter exploded with ban bump stocks, ban bump stocks. And I stood up, having thought this through, and said, of course, we can ban bump stocks, but, but I don't support this current move from the Republican-led Congress and the White House to say, let's ban bump stocks, because here's what we know. We know that this technology, which I don't think is a valuable technology for society, has had a teeny tiny little impact 
on the massacres that we're experiencing in America. Banning bump stocks is not going to solve the problem. So sure, let's ban bump stocks, but not at the expense of doing real firearm reform. <coughs> on Twitter the next day, Heather Ross is opposed to banning bump stocks. Okay. So bump stock gate, which is what my campaign staff came to call it, was that was really when I began to understand the problem of these false dualities that our current political climate is holding up. What else happened? Oh, uh, was attacked uh, for immigration and border security. My stance is that Yes, of course we need strong border security. I often refer to what my great-grandmother who emigrated here from what is now Ukraine uh, would have called F that cockamamie wall. That is what she would have said. May she rest in peace. Um, we do need border security. Building a big concrete wall was not going to do it. We do, as a nation, need to really embrace immigration. And we need to do it in a responsible way. I was attacked from the far left for saying that we needed border security and that we needed to be responsible about immigration. I was attacked from the far right for saying not a big concrete wall. I talked with a friend of mine who is a Republican legislator here in Arizona. <coughs> P.S. <coughs> our friendship was limited to phone calls during the campaign. We could not be seen in public together. We couldn't get a coffee or a glass of wine together because it would have been, for both of us, political suicide with our own parties, okay? We compared notes on the immigration thing. Uh, we also compared notes, what was the other thing? We, we were both attacked by our respective parties for exactly the same things. Oh, for being too bipartisan. We were attacked for being too bipartisan and we were attacked for calling for, really demanding responsible immigration reform. Yeah. My, uh, my race was deemed by the Arizona Republic to be one of the races that was worthy of making an endorsement. And so here's how this works. The uh, editorial board calls you into the room and uh, interviews all of the candidates together. This is how the Arizona Republic does it. All of my friends who have either run large newspapers elsewhere or been on the editorial boards of other large newspapers said like this is a crazy way to do this process and normally they would interview candidates one by one but that's not what they did for for my race and that's not what the Arizona Republic does one of the questions that they asked is what's the biggest problem in the Democratic Party and the answers from the other uh, candidates were messaging um, uh, not liberal enough, it just felt weird to me. Um, and I said, the biggest problem with the Democratic Party is the biggest problem with the Republican Party. And you know when a dog is confused and kind of gives you that look like, huh? Well, that's what some of the editorialists did. Like, huh? Um, what do you mean? No, no, that can't be right. And I said, the biggest problem is the same in both parties. It is the problem of purity tests. It is the problem of litmus tests. I was not endorsed by the Arizona Republic. They were not interested in hearing that. Ah, here's one of the other field notes from the campaign trail. All right, so let's review. I'm a nurse practitioner. I've been doing it for 20 years. I'm a professor of health policy. I was continuously attacked for 
not supporting Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All plan. Constantly. I said it doesn't have legs to stand on. If we're going to put a policy forward, we can't just cast off clouds and dreams and unicorns and say we're just going to do it. How are we going to pay for it? And I would tell people, listen, one in seven jobs in my congressional district is in the healthcare industry. And Bernie Sanders' plan would threaten thousands of jobs immediately. And I, as a policymaker, can't do that. And people would say to me, but Bernie says, and holy cow, science, numbers, expertise had no purchase, no purchase on the campaign trail. It's a real problem. So what? So what did I learn? I learned that we, the science community, we are not doing a good job of science communication. Now, there are people in this room that I am so proud to work with and I love very much, and I am here to tell you that we collectively are not doing a good job at what we think we're doing a good job at. Which is great news, there's more work to do. You never want to work yourself out of a job, but we do need to do a better job at it. We need to do a better job of communicating complexity. That's something that we all think about in our work, and we have to do a better job of communicating that to the public. The broader impacts paragraphs we write in our grant applications, that is not enough. We have to do better. If we don't do better at engaging the public, we won't be able to do our jobs anymore. If we want to work ourselves out of a job, that's a really good way to do it, is to not do the right job that we need to do of communicating science and complexity to the public. And we risk collapsing, we risk our country collapsing into a regime that's controlled by people who are willing to live by litmus tests if it gets them the votes that they need on election day. That sounds crass. It sounds oversimplified. But I am here to tell you, that's reality. Governance, as we know it and understand it, will be history. <clears throat> Dave Gustin's book about border organizations, or what's the term? Boundary. Boundary organizations. That will be a work of history, period. OK? Just understand that. So what do we have to do? We have to join the resistance against false dualities. This is our work. This is our work. We've got a lot of work to do together. So with that, I've been talking at you plenty long. I'd love to take your questions. Gary. Uh, Heather. Uh, first of all, I, I followed your race very closely, I know you do. mostly because it's you, but also <laughs> that I'm a political junkie and I follow that I plot campaign. All right, with everything you've learned, everything you told us about, had you been aware of it and done it in your campaign, would you be in Congress today? Uh, there are a few things. Um, if I, one of the things that I didn't do that I would do differently is hit back against lies. My opponents in my primary <coughs> had a difficult relationship with the truth. And I chose to run as the front runner and I was widely acknowledged to be the front runner. I had a long list of endorsements from uh, political figures, from labor organizations, from national health care organizations that I was very, very, I remain very, very proud of. Um, and I thought, I'm not going to even call attention to these opponents because people are going to see, obviously, these are lies. People did not see that they were lies. And so I would hit back. 
Okay. And 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 I will follow up. We had polling. The counterfactual, we had polling that I would have won the general election. Let so. me follow up with that. If you look at the Arizona congressional delegation, mm -hmm. a, a significant share, let me state this as delicately as I can. Now just say it. I, all right. Uh, uh, three or four people, and I'm sure we, we would agree uh -huh. on that list, are idiots. I'm not talking about left right. I'm talking about could not pass an eighth grade interpretation of the Constitution. Yeah. Have yeah. no idea how Congress works. Mm -hmm. All right. We're, we're talking about a prosperous, relatively well educated population. Uh -huh. All right. And in some cases, and I think we agree on that one, it's <coughs> outright corruption. Mm -hmm. right. All right. Why can't we beat these people? Not everybody is a Trumper. Not everybody is, you know, uh, along those lines. Why can't we beat them? Well, there's a few reasons we can't beat them. One, People don't show up to vote. I could ask you to raise your hands if you voted in the general election. I can ask you to raise your hands if you voted in the primary election. So thank you for those of you who did. Um, no, I mean, you know, because there's shame involved, because I happen to know that not every registered voter in this room voted in elections. Not everyone who is eligible to vote in this room is a registered voter. And that is a big effing problem in our country. I was just listening to an interview with John Kerry this morning. Think what you want about John Kerry. He made the point that we got so excited about this amazing midterm turnout. Almost 49%. Less than half of Americans, eligible voters, are voting. That is a big problem. And as I told you, the people who are voting are uninformed about candidates, they're mm -hmm. uninformed about issues, and they're voting based on the signs that they saw on the road. And I am here to tell you, there are lies. There are outright lies on those signs. And you know what the great thing is? is that it's America, and those lies are protected speech. So that's what I would do differently, and that's you know what the problem is going forward. Adam. Uh, thanks for your talk, thanks for running. Uh, could you characterize a bit more uh, attack? I'm wondering if you're specifically referring to uh, outside the norms of political criticism or if you're including uh, normal political criticism and if it's both was one more common than that. So I I heard like half of that. Oh I'm a little talk. Uh, <laughs> could you from the diaphragm. Yeah, could you <clears throat> further characterize what you mean when you say attacked by your opponents? Which oh sure. Was always vehement or was it <clears throat> Oh, uh, very frequently it would take a statement that I made and spin it to mean something else. For example, uh, one of the things I talked about was using our immigration system to fill some of the uh, job categories and some of the roles that we don't have enough Americans filling. For example, um, one of the examples I call and I said, listen, there are a lot of communities across the country where there just aren't enough teachers. There are plenty of qualified teachers who would come to America and do that service. Why can't we use our immigration system to give us the workforce that we need to educate our next generation? That was turned into, Heather Ross wants to replace teachers with immigrants. <laughs> yeah. I gave you the example of the ASU professor who very, very publicly, Heather Ross is not going to represent us Democrats. Heather Ross is not going to represent us progressives. Heather Ross is too bipartisan. Therefore, she can't represent us. I also was attacked for my support of Israel as a national security partner. 
as a result of some of those attacks, I now uh, have, I, I've come to know the FBI Special Agents in the Hate Crimes Division better than I expected to. They're in my cell phone, and they're lovely. <laughs> I'm sorry that I needed them. But they really are lovely. So, some examples. Yeah. Yes? Um, so I really appreciate your talk because it was on the lines of lessons from practice, but one of the things I cannot grapple with is that you began your talk with saying that humans are inherently complex, and but they cannot deal with complexity and uh, don't know how to uh, you know, understand complexity. And then you ended by saying that we need to do a better job in communicating that complexity and teach them about complexity. So that just seems contradictory. And I'm wondering whether that is the right approach. Uh, I mean, teaching complexity for people who cannot understand complexity. Yeah, thank you for your question. I, the world is complex. We have a system of democracy in America that asks voters to make decisions about the governance of our country based on complex issues. But the voting population doesn't like to think about <coughs> complex issues. They like to think about immigration, good or bad. Universal health care, good or bad. Guns, good or bad. These are all incredibly complex issues and we need voters to be able to make evaluations with an understanding of that complexity. So yes, I've set up this, we, we've got a problem. Issues are complex. People in themselves are complex. But it's but complexity is hard to think about and people don't like to think about it. If we want to continue <coughs> to have a functioning democracy, we need to bring the voting public into being able to think about the complexities. Yeah. So I had a question. So you've talked a lot about understanding and complexity, but I wonder what role emotion plays, right? So we have this question that people understand things often through their emotions or through their guts. And then when we talk about science communication, we're often thinking at this level of head, mm -hmm. right? Creating that false duality between heart and head. So Absolutely. from your place and your experience, how do you think that emotions or feelings or we can access that to teach complexity or to address them? Yeah, one of the things I came to understand very, very early, one of my campaign staff said, the longest distance in the world is the distance between your head and your heart. And she's not wrong. It's very uh, difficult to uh, talk in our head or talk in the heart. And that's the work that we have to do. You're absolutely right. People understand from emotion. That's why story is so critically important. That people understand the world through story. Our communication as the science community has to engage in story. And this goes to the uh, this goes to teaching anything. You can put up graph after chart after table. Nobody remembers a thing that you said, but if you tell a story, everybody remembers. Because story calls on emotion. <coughs> They're not exclusive. We make them exclusive, but we can't continue to do that if we're going to be able to go forward. Yeah, great question, thank you. Yeah. Hi, well first of all, thank you for that talk. It was very interesting. Um, I wanna give you a basic question, but before that I just want to make a distinction just to see if I understood it correctly with regards to the source of these false dualities. You say that the source is actually human nature, right? We want to think in these dualities. And that the system is not per se the source, but that the system, the political system we are in, doesn't cope well with that, right? 
Well, the political system copes great with false dualities, but well, I mean, in a direction that we may not be comfortable with because it's not congruent with the reality right. of scientific yes. living. Okay. Yeah. Well, then my question would be, do you think that there are other political systems that do this better? Oh, listen, my favorite, okay, I love C-SPAN. Not everybody loves C-SPAN. I love C-SPAN. I really love watching Parliament on C-SPAN too. It's, I could watch Parliament yeah. all day long. I know, right? It's great, it's great. And I think that parliamentary systems and people, I would often have um, pe European uh, people who either uh, have become American citizens or were just kind of along for the ride, uh, say, well, don't you think that multi-party systems and that parliamentary systems were better? Um, listen, every system has its problems, but there is a lot to be said for parliamentary systems and forcing coalition governments and things like this. Um, yeah, there's a lot to be said for parliamentary systems. There's plenty of, of valid criticism to be levied on America's two-party system. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, you ran in the Congressional Six in the year. I did. And uh, what are the registration numbers? Uh, yeah, great question. It is, um, set, so there's a 17 point advantage Republicans over Democrats for, uh, in terms of registration advantage and a significant chunk of uh, independence in the middle. So it's like 43% Republicans and then do the rest of that math. Yes. Now, what did your campaign do to try to convince 17% Republican have advantage to vote for you. So my campaign unfortunately uh, ended with the primary. Um, I, lots of people told me and people nationally and people who hold elected office said, oh, you're running the general election. And yes, I did. I was running the general election. That's how I treated my my whole campaign because I at the end of the day and I would not there are plenty of tactics that I would do differently were I to ever run again uh, in the, for that race but one thing I would not do is change my messaging because I'm not going to stand up and say something that I don't think is a good idea for our district and for our country just because I think it's going to get me an applause line in a room. Plenty of politicians will, and I've seen it happen. I've seen stories shift all over the place. So, things that I would say to Republicans are, listen, I'm a Democrat, and, well, I'll give you an example. One of my patients is a registered Republican in my district. And I, you know, told him, I, he came in for an appointment, and I said, and he's a, a retired Army Ranger. And I said, Hey, I, you know, I'm, I'm running for Congress. And he said, oh, that's great. That's, you'll, you'll be great. And he said, wait a second. <laughs> You're not one of those Democrats, are you? And I said, well, yeah, I am. He said, oh, I knew it. And I said, hold on a minute. Hold on. How long have you known me? And he said, I don't know, five, six years. I said, right. We agree on a whole lot of things, don't we? And he said, yeah. Yeah, we do. And I said, exactly. We agree on a whole lot more than we disagree on. And when I would go out and talk with people, I would say, listen, I talk with everybody. I have had people, I, I have shaken the hands of people who told me I'm a baby killer because I'm pro-choice. I have shaken the hands of people who told me I commit crimes against humanity because I support the state of Israel. And I say, at the end of the day, we're all looking for the same things. At the end of the day, we're all trying to put a roof over our head and food on the table and know that our communities, our families are safe. Basically those three things, it's all the same. We've all got the same goals. We've all got the, the same end of the line values. Now how we get there is a little bit different, but we gotta focus on our core values, and they're the same. And I'm very proud to tell you that I have, I had campaign donors who were Republicans, very generous donors who were Republicans. I had 
on the ground, behind the scenes support from Republicans who do hold or have held public office. So that's what I was doing. At the end of the day, it's the same things everybody's looking for. I don't care if you got a D after your name or an R. So that's what I was doing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um are you, are you concerned at all about the false dualities of um, science and anti-science, facts and values, through all, our simple truths versus their simple lies? I mean, a lot of the, you, you didn't use the term post-truth in your talk, but um, in a lot, but um, I have seen a lot of discourse around this idea of post-truth. In addition to implying a pre-lapsary and past and things were different. Um, we're going to describe um, a phenomenon I've seen in a lot of Brian Wynn's work, where in capital S, or representatives of capital S science produce public alienation from expertise and from the sciences by insisting upon a position of unquestioned episode of privilege mm -hmm. for the sciences. Um, and it seems to me, I don't know, just it, look, looking at the march for science, looking at a lot of the of the rhetoric around house about around the rightful place of science in society, which we deal with critically, and also probably critically here a lot. Um, it doesn't seem to me like persons in the public sphere who claim who claim to speak on behalf of science are doing a very good job of of, of justifying epistemically or morally science's value to society. Mm -hmm. uh, you're right. Uh, so I have a few things to say about that. One, as I said, we're not doing a good job. We, the science community, are not doing a good job of communicating why science is important and why understanding science and understanding complexity is important. Now, there are plenty of people who stand up and say, I'm all in for science, and then proceed to introduce legislation that has no regard for science, or worse, that is built on premises that don't hold up under scrutiny. But they say, I'm pro-science blah, 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 and just sort of gloss over the realities. Case in point, one of our congressional delegation from here in Arizona is very big on macroeconomic analysis. And in crafting the uh, tax bill that passed in the spring of 2018, uh, really held up math and science and built the entire economic analysis on growth estimates that were completely unrealistic and refuted by the vast majority of economists in our nation. So just recently, this member of Congress stood up and criticized a proposed budget bill for saying that it stripped the requirement for macroeconomic analysis out and it was therefore anti-math and anti-science. Now this ignores the reality that there is such a thing as the Congressional Budget Office that does economic analysis. It also ignores the observation that the quote science, the economics that was brought into the tax bill was absolutely flawed, deeply flawed. So it's a big problem that we aren't communicating it and we have not grown a society that is capable, that has the skills to do any kind of critical evaluation of these statements. One of the things that I learned was from Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti who said, the Democrats have to stop being the smarty pants party. It's true. <clears throat> a lot, most scientists, all of the scientists who ran for Congress in 2018 were Democrats. Scientists tend to be smarty pants, myself included. And Democrats have indeed been the smarty pants party in saying, well, this is the most important thing, and here I'm going to give you these charts and graphs to show you why. That doesn't work. Let me tell you what, when you're knocking on the door of somebody who is struggling to not get evicted from their home, who is struggling 
to put food into their child's backpack and get them to school without fear of being shot on the way. And these are real concerns that real people who live in my district shared with me when I knocked on their door. Those people don't care about the charts and graphs, and they don't care about the philosophical arguments for why science is important. We have to do better. We can't just do more. We have to do differently in order to do better. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> we just need Cory Booker here. I'm sure he'll be here in the next few months. We may not get him unless we have someone who needs rescuing in a fiery building. I know.